If there are two things I love most in this world, they would be my parents and my friends. Aside from that though, I also really love Pokemon and art. In fact, back in the day when I was just a wee little thing, I would quite frequently use those two passions in combination with each other. I remember making a plethora of creatures that maybe weren't quite Pokemon, but were definitely Pokemon inspired. Throughout the years, I've gained a ton of new interests and moved from one thing to another in terms of my current hyperfixations, but Pokemon and art have always remained a constant love of mine, even after all this time. Truth be told, I'm not actually a fake Mon artist, at least not in the sense that it is exclusively my main focus of drawing. Actually, I really like creating my own original characters and worlds and creating short stories centered around those. I only recently got back into drawing Pokemon and even creating fake Mon around the time Scarlet and Violet were first announced, when I decided it might be fun to try and make a couple fake evolutions for Hue Coco, to see if I could fool anyone into believing they were real. It didn't exactly work out that way, but it did get me started again on thinking about what Pokemon in that game and possible future games might look like. And so from that point on, the beast was set loose once again, and I've been occasionally dabbling in making fake Mon here and there for my own enjoyment since. Now, if you've read the title of this video, then you're probably here because you're interested in learning how I make my designs. But before we get into it, I want to thank Oberdan, as they were actually the person who presented this idea to me when I'd asked for suggestions after my last Dino Starter video. Admittedly, I'm not the best at offering tutorials or advice, and my way is by no means the best way to do things, so keep in mind you might have to adapt some of what I offer to fit your own processes as we go, but I'll try to give you as good a rundown as I can of at least the basic parts of what I do. With that said, let's get started. This is going to sound a little counterintuitive, but before we get into doing any drawing, there's a level of concepting that needs to be done first. Basically, getting your ideas in order and establishing a theme so that you know generally the gist of what you're going to be drawing before putting pen to paper. If you look at most official Pokémon, for example, especially in the newer gens, a lot of them have one to two, sometimes even three or more themes that are prevalent throughout their designs. Blaziken, for example, isn't just a big fire chicken, he's a kickboxer, hence the shape and design of its body with a heavy focus being placed on its thick and powerful legs. Vulpix and Ninetales aren't just foxes with fire, they're based on Kitsune, a Japanese folk creature that grows more tails as it grows older, wiser, and more powerful. Tadbulb isn't just an electric tadpole, he's a light bulb. Appleton is, is literally an Appleton. There are a wide range of ways you can incorporate your themes into your designs, from the more subtle ones like Ninetales, to the more on-the-nose type ones like Appleton and Tadbulb. There's really no wrong way to do it, but it is good to consider your theme beforehand so that you know why and how to make those design choices. Thinking it over first can really help you out in the long run. When trying to come up with themes for your designs, you can quite literally look anywhere. From objects lying around your house, to things that you'd find outside, to even cryptids, other bits of folklore, jobs, foods, and more. It might even be fun to challenge yourself. If you feel like you're having a hard time and you can't think of anything, take two random things, stick them together, and see what you can make out of it. Personally, when I make a fake mon, I try to decide on the things that are easier to answer up front. So questions like, how many evolution stages will this Pokémon have? Well, that depends. What type of Pokémon am I trying to make? A starter or pseudo-legendary? Probably three. A common beginning route mon like Zigzagoon or Poochiana? Two or less. Basically correlating them to the rarity of the mon and what is typical for that niche. Legendaries don't usually evolve, for example, so if I made a legendary, it likely wouldn't either. But anything is possible, so exceptions can always be made if needed. A fake mon's typing can also be answered to some degree using the same method. Starters, for example, have always had the grass, water, and fire type choices. Any secondary types from there are usually, but not always, based on another triad of type options that would work in the rock-paper-scissors format. From there, any other questions I may have, like what animal or object I want to base my design off of, will usually revolve around my selected theme in some way, or the type of niche I want my mon to fill. If my goal is to make ancient dino Pokémon, I'm probably not going to pick an animal from current day. Again, there can always be exceptions to the rule, but this is the sort of thing I try to keep in mind when coming up with my ideas. If I may, I'd now like to walk you through this exact process using a design I made for this video as an example. In rapid fire, here is the list of things that I know to be true before going into making my design. 
I want this design to be based on Spinosaurus. More specifically, I want it to be based on two of the different renditions of Spinosaurus over time. One, when it was first reconstructed, and two, the more modern-day reconstruction. I also want to base this design on the fact that back during ancient times, if someone happened to find the remains of a dinosaur or other ancient creature, they would often misinterpret what the bones were remains of, just because they didn't know any better at the time. And so we ended up getting things like Cyclops from misinterpretations of mammoth bones, where the large middle nasal cavity of the mammoth was thought to have been an eye socket, or fearsome dragons from dinosaur bones, which actually works out quite wonderfully, because I also want this design to be a pseudo-legendary dragon type. So, a Spino, a dragon, and it's a pseudo-legendary, which means three forms. Now, I can get started. As I get into sketching, another little tip I can offer is that it might be easier, especially if you're doing a multi-stage design like this one, to think about the last stage and what you want it to look like, and then build your primary stages off of that, all the while simplifying them down. The beginning stages of a Mon are usually simple and cute, with much smaller bodies and more chibi proportions, and the theme may not be as prominent in them when compared to later stages, which can grow more complex and lean harder into it. Rowlet is a very good example of this, because it looks just like a little leaf owl, but as it evolves, it steadily grows into that archer theme. First with Dartrix and the dart feathers, and then finally with the arrows and Robin Hood design on Decidueye. I know I want my final design to look the most like a dragon mixed with the current rendition of a Spinosaurus, and I want the first stage to look like the very first rendition of a Spinosaurus, as it was thought of in the 1900s. But any additional details aside from that should be kept simple and cute for the baby form. I'm going to go ahead and start with designing the last stage. Usually, I work on my laptop in Photoshop, but this time I decided to give Procreate on the iPad a try, as its time-lapse feature lets me work intermittently so I can take breaks to sleep, eat, and do my daily duties between drawing. Typically, I use a hard round brush that I customize to have a slight jitter effect so that it gives off more of a pencil drawing feel. And I try to keep it set at a smaller size, like around 6 pixels or so, but when I imported my brushes into Procreate, they ended up turning into more of a binary pixel type brush. If anyone knows why that is, and why they no longer act like they do in Photoshop, I would love to know how to fix that. Regardless though, if you're doing this digitally, or with pen and paper, the drawing process itself should be largely the same. It took me quite a while to get the design for this stage nailed down, and you can see it here with how many times I erase and go back and erase again. There actually were other attempts even before these, but they didn't make it into the final time lapse. I want to largely make this design based off of the modern Spinosaurus, but I do take a few creative liberties here and there, like splitting the signature sail into two large dragon wings and making its body built more off of simple condensed shapes as much as possible since a lot of Pokémon tend to be more squat or compact as opposed to long and more naturally proportioned. For the final stage, I also end up redoing the pose, so that it's roaring with jaws open wide, because I want it to show off a bit more of that ferocious nature, and posing is a very good way to get across a particular attitude or express certain emotions to the viewer. For example, if this design was meant to be more of a sleepy little guy, then I might have drawn him laying down and dozing off. It's also important to try and find a balance between a pose that shows your design clearly, and that conveys the emotion you want clearly. If you'll notice, a lot of Pokémon sprites and official artwork tend to go for poses that show the most of the design, while also clearly expressing emotion. You won't see a lot of Pokémon with wings or limbs that cover their bodies, or Pokémon that are facing away from the camera unless that's part of their design scheme like Mawile showing off its hair mouth, because they want the viewer to be able to clearly see the most important parts of the design without covering them up or hiding it and making it unreadable. With the final stage sketched and lined, I move on to the stage 1 design. I try to give it more of an upright posture and a blunt carnosaur-like head, as opposed to the Spino's elongated snout, as well as removing the flat ridge shape from the end of its tail to give it more of a basic lizard tail shape, and giving it the rounded spine from older depictions of Spinosaurus. I do add a couple nubs onto the tail, not because they're part of any Spinosaurus reconstructions, but more so to hint that something is going to be happening with the tail later on as it grows. Again though, I'm also trying to keep the design simple, cute, and compact to really drive home the fact that this is still just the baby stage 1 form. From here, I move on to the middle stage, and with this one, I wanted to do something a bit different. 
I could have done an in-between stage using one of the more recent but not modern depictions of Spinosaurus, but I felt that the design would have been too similar to the final form. After all, some depictions of prior Spino are practically the same as the modern day one, just without the paddle tail or with a different shape to their spine. Sure, I could have done it anyway and given it an in-between stage like Gabite is to Gibble and Garchomp, but I wanted to try something different and do a bit of a callback to something that Pokémon hasn't done in a while with their pseudo-legendaries. A pupil stage, like Pupitar and Shelgon. Or at least, my version of one. And so I curl my tiny guy up into a ball and stuff him inside a sphere so I can ponder over him like the wizard I've always wanted to be. I elected to go with the pupa stage idea because it's one that is just overall really fun to me. It's like, your little guy goes into a box and you don't know what you're gonna get out of it until he finally evolves. A little surprise, and the lack of any strong indicators from the middle stage makes it all the harder to guess what the final result will be. Next, I begin the coloring stage. And if you're gonna be drawing on the computer, I can give you a really quick and easy tip for filling in the base color of your design. When I do my line art, I put it on its own individual layer separate from the sketch and background layers. When it comes time to fill in the color, I'll take the magic wand tool, or in this case the select tool in Procreate, and select the entire area outside of my line art. Hopefully when I do this, my line art is entirely enclosed and none of the selection leaks into the inside of my lines. If it does, then I have to go around and find the opening and draw it closed. But once I have the outside selected, I'll make a new layer underneath my lines and flip the selection to inverse. In Photoshop, you can do this by going to Select and then Inverse in the menu bar, or using the associated keyboard shortcut. In Procreate, you just hit Invert Selection. Then with the Fill Bucket tool on the layer that you made under your line art, simply fill in the selected area. This should fill in all of the area underneath your lines, and from there you can alpha lock the layer if you're using Procreate, which won't let you color outside of the fill, or on Photoshop, press the little button to lock transparent pixels. This should keep anything you color over that locked within the confines of the shape you just filled. For coloring details that I want to keep separate from the base, if I'm using Photoshop, I'll simply make a new layer over the base layer and set it to be a clipping mask for that layer which allows me to color on the clipping mask so that the details remain separate without going outside of my predefined base shape. On Procreate, I believe I just made a separate alpha layer. As far as colors themselves go, this isn't a hard rule, but it helps sometimes to try and pick colors that are based on the typing that your fake mon has. A lot of grass types, for example, are majority green or yellow, with occasional other colors on the flowers. A lot of poison and ghost types are purple, black, gray, or other darker colors. A lot of fire types are red or have red on them. Electric types are often yellow, blue, black, and the list goes on. Again, this doesn't always have to be the case, and there are exceptions. I mean, just look at Palkia or Flygon. But it is true for a lot of things, so it might be helpful, if you're stumped on colors, to think of something with a palette similar to its type. It's also important to note that when deciding on markings, try to keep to simple, flat colors as much as possible. Try to not use gradients, or if you have to, keep them to a minimum. Pokémon designs often don't use gradients because they have to keep the characters simple for animation, in particular when doing the anime. Gradients are often hard to accurately reproduce in animated media, and can be time-consuming to work with the more of them that you have on a design. That isn't to say Pokémon with gradient colorations don't exist, but they're still in the grand minority of designs, and you'll see a lot more Pokémon with gradients that have been simplified to solid color transitions in order to achieve a similar effect, like Hisuian Zorua or Zoroark. For my design specifically, I decided on blues for the wings and tail, which are intended to be made entirely out of water, and browns for the body. I figured this would be one of the times an exception to the rule was okay, since a lot of Dragon-type Pokémon don't seem to have any one particular color theme and can tend to fluctuate from colors that match with their secondary typings to colors that have nothing to do with any of them. In this case, the brown is being pulled from the black-tipped Reef Shark, another aquatic predator that for some reason came to mind while I was drawing. For the most part, I try to keep my colors and markings simple and stick to methods that appear in official Pokémon artwork. However, I do add my own spin on things here and there, like on the watery parts of this design, where I've colored them in a style that is more similar to my usual one, rather than sticking to the way the Pokémon style would have done it. As an aside, if you ever aren't sure how to draw or color something, and you want to make it look convincing for the Pokémon style, it is 100% okay to use other official Pokémon designs for reference. Look at them, 
break them down, and try to figure out how and why they made something the way they did. It's how everyone learns a style, and even how industry professionals with their own drawing styles manage to work on the same projects, shows, movies, and whatever else, all the while keeping a consistent look despite being entirely different people. That isn't to say copy something one-to-one, -one, but really try to look at and understand it so that you can apply the same techniques to your drawings. Again, you don't have to, but if your aim is to make something that is convincing, then it might be a good idea to practice and study those things. My aim here is mainly just to have fun, so I stick to it where I can, but may dip back into my own style every so often just because it's more enjoyable for me in the end. Finally, the last part of my coloring process is to add the shading. I use a simple cell shading technique, and on a separate layer we'll color in the areas that should be in shadow. Basically, thinking of the design not as a two-dimensional flat object, but a creature with three-dimensional form. I use a light purple color for most of my shading, and then set the layer itself to multiply at a low opacity. Once that's done, I'll go back in and with an eraser set to low opacity, I'll erase tiny bits off the most visible edge of each shaded area. For the lighting, I usually add another layer over top, and setting that layer to overlay, I will pick a color that matches the hue of the area that I'm coloring over, but is just a bit lighter. And with a chalk brush set to a very low opacity, around 15 to 25 percent, I will begin adding little splotches around the top parts of rounded edges, or in places where the most light would catch on the creature's body. Keep in mind that every stroke you make with a brush in these settings is going to get lighter and lighter as you layer more strokes onto each other, so you'll have to think about how to lay them down in order to get the look you want. Sometimes it's also helpful to go back in with a low opacity eraser and use that to refine some of the edges. Another thing that I personally like to do is color around the underside edges of lips, nostrils, and eyes, as well as adding little streaks of light to nails and claws in order to really make them pop. With all of the coloring done, one of the last things I do is go in and think of names and descriptions. Generally, I'll have a vague idea already of what I want to use as a Fakemon's dex entry, and from there I'm just going in and fleshing it out and writing stuff down in a clear way that tells a little bit about what it's like, where it lives, or just random facts about the creature. For names, I'll usually write down a list of words and synonyms of words that pertain to the theme of the fake mon that I made, and then try to come up with varying ways of mixing them together until I get something that feels nice to say aloud. I do want to mention, for Refossil specifically, a good friend of mine actually was the one to come up with a name for that stage of the design, so I can't take any credit for that one. I'm not sure that they'd want me to mention them by name, but you know who you are, so thank you. Lastly, the one thing left that goes into making these designs, apart from doing the video itself, are the cries. The little sound effect that you hear when meeting a Pokémon in battle or looking it up in the Pokédex. Quite a few of my bigger designs have had them so far, and I think it adds a fun element when you can actually hear how the creature might sound, so I'd like to show how I go about making the sound effects for designs like those. I make all of my sounds in GarageBand, and before doing anything, I try to build a sound profile in my head for the type of creature that I've made something that matches its overall look and feel. A deep rumbling sound for a large robust mon, for example, or tiny cute noises for smaller baby designs. Then, once I have a general idea of what I'm aiming for, I try to find an instrument that matches that sort of tone. Sometimes, I might even layer multiple instruments over one another, and using the musical typing feature available in GarageBand, I'll just play several random notes or chords. <coughs>
Once I'm satisfied with those, I save them all as an mp3 file and import them into Final Cut, where I'll then proceed to cut them apart and stack them on the timeline, all the while speeding up or slowing down the clips as I see fit, and adding random audio effects to them from the preset effects available through Final Cut, until they sound distorted enough to no longer be discernible as individual instruments, but instead sound similar to a cry you might hear in a Pokemon game. So here it is after I've touched the voice parts of the audio where I'm going <sighs> into the mic. These aren't touched yet, these are the instruments. Sounds way different. Now I have to do these ones. <laughs> All right, and these are what it sounds like after I've cut them up, sped them up, slowed them down, stacked them, added a million different effects. And here's a little bonus, because I like this one a lot personally too. This one started out as me going blah, 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 into the mic. Isn't that sick? Oh, I love technology. Apart from that, there's no real method I have for doing this. It's all just random trial and error until I get something that sounds the way I want it to. Now, with all of that done, I can reveal to you the finished product. The fruits of my labor. I didn't want this to just be a one-off design. From the very beginning, I knew I wanted it to be an addition to what I'm now going to be calling the Meso region. And though I likely won't be dedicating all of my time to filling out this dex with any sort of consistent regularity, who knows, maybe I'll manage to chip away enough at it over time to eventually flesh out an entire region. So here we go, a pseudo-legendary dragon water type based on different iterations of Spinosaurus, another dino fakemon for an ancient time. We start with Carnaby, the tiny dragon Pokemon. Carnaby is a small Pokemon that would have lived near vast rivers in ancient times. Its upright posture and the shape of its figure allow its body to act as a buoy, helping it to keep its tiny head above the water's surface, as it is not yet as adept a swimmer as its parents. Despite this, however, it loves to carelessly wander out into the water in an attempt to learn how to swim. This can become particularly troublesome for its parents during the rainy season when water levels rise, and every year droves of Carnaby will be washed away, whereupon its elder packmates will have to swim out and save them. The fins on a Carnaby's back will often reflect the salinity and quality of the water that it was raised near. Then there's Refossil, the developing Pokémon. Once Carnaby has grown old enough, it will begin to encase itself inside of a protective cocoon made entirely of water. Whilst inside this bubble, it will effectively be locked into a suspended state, no longer feeling the need to eat or drink, though it must retain the moisture encasing its central form. The outer shell of its body will harden, and it will begin to undergo an intense metamorphosis that typically lasts through the drought period until the rains return again in the spring. Refossil is still capable of movement while like this, though it has been noted to be much slower on land than in water, and it is widely thought that once it opens its eyes, it is ready to emerge from its chrysalis and evolve. And last is Rivenator, the water dragon Pokémon. The final form of Carnaby and Refossil. Rivenator is an aquatic hunter spending a large majority of its time in or around water. It is an excellent swimmer and uses its large wings and paddle-like tail to propel itself quietly through the water against strong river currents, and once it has found a nice spot, will settle down and lie in wait to snap up unsuspecting prey with long, gator-like jaws. In the past, its bones were often misidentified due to the deterioration and loss of its aqueous features, leading many reconstructions and depictions of this Pokémon to be inaccurate and as such led to great surprise when a living specimen was found in a far-off region. And that's it. That's all I've got for you today. Hopefully the design was enjoyable, and this was at least somewhat helpful to one of you out there as a process video. If there's anything about how I make these designs that you'd like further clarification on, feel free to ask me down in the comments, and I'll answer for you as best I can. Apart from that, I just recently noticed that we're really close to hitting a thousand subscribers on this channel, and honestly, I'm astounded. Thank you guys so much for stopping by, watching, and even taking a moment to chat. Knowing that the things I make resonate with someone out there in the world really makes it all the more worthwhile and fun, and I hope to keep putting out stuff for you guys to enjoy in the future. I'm thinking of doing something special for a 1k sub video, but it might take me a little bit to whip together, so if I'm a little late to drop it once we hit a thousand, just know it'll be coming soon. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then feel free to like and subscribe so you can keep up with whatever may come next. And don't forget to tune in next time, where I will 
be washed out to sea, thereby forcing my parents and friends to come and rescue me. 